So good evening, everybody. Paul Sterling here. Welcome to Heart to Heart Communication Method. And I am going to be diving deep into this topic tonight. It's going to be interactive questions, answers. So we're going to learn how to go from heart to heart. We're going to look at how to listen so other people want to open up and talk to you, how to talk so other people really want to listen, and how to spend less time arguing and more time loving each other. So who would be interested in something like that? You know, This is a quote from John Denver. Love is a light that shines from heart to heart. And um, I <laughs> met up with John at an event. He did really let his heart shine. So most people want their heart to shine. And here's what typically happens. And I want to ask you, have you ever noticed that almost every relationship problem started with a communication problem? Yeah. And it's yeah. something to think about. And then it escalates. And almost all of the problems out there come from this factor. This is another one of my mentors. And again, I had more hair when I was studying with Marshall Rosenberg, the creator of nonviolent communication. He said, the normal outcome of most communication is misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And so this is a chance to look at why does that happen and what can you do about it? So we're gonna dive into looking at some of the problems and then what we can do about it. So. There was a report of the top 12 reasons for divorce. This is from Women's Health Magazine. And the number one issue was communication. Mm -hmm. Number two, falling out of love. There's no intimacy, not a partnership anymore. Weren't ready for relationship or marriage. But underneath almost all of these things was a lack of communication. Mm -hmm. So let's dive in here and look at what happens. This is sort of the downward spiral. Communicating from BSW. And what does BSW stand for? It stands for bad, stupid, wrong. So a lot of times what we're trying to take is we're trying to make each other bad, stupid, and wrong. And when that happens, no one feels heard, understood, or valued. The harder we try to convince somebody that they're bad, stupid, and wrong, the worst things get. We end up tripping each other's triggers, constant <laughs> conflicts that erode trust and intimacy, and it can take days, weeks, months, or never. You can hit, I call a P-O-N-R, the point of no return. All right, so what happens when we communicate from heart to heart? What happens is both of us feel heard, understood, and valued. And when you're communicating heart to heart, you can meet triggers with courage, compassion, and curiosity. And you feel confident knowing how to repair when people do get an upset. Because no matter how good you are communicating, there are going to be challenges. And when you communicate that way, it builds trust and intimacy. You can rebound from upsets. Instead of days, you can rebound sometimes in minutes. You're going to get Paul's life history here in about two minutes. I did not start out to be a relationship coach. In fact, along the way, I went through one divorce, four broken engagements. And at one point, it was like either become a relationship master or just become a monk. So at age 17, I was on the Mad Dogs exhibition ski team. And our motto was hot skiing, warm women, and cold beer. I met a guy named Thorne Tasker. He convinced me to go to Alaska, become a commercial fisherman. At age 21, we brought this 80-foot boat, it was known as the Olympic King, around from Florida all the way to Alaska. So that's me with my Alaskan rough and tumble look. While I was in Alaska, I met a guy named Robert Kiyosaki. Any of you familiar with Robert Kiyosaki? He wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He had come to Alaska and he introduced me to the world of transformation and personal growth. And it was like, it transformed my life. And then he also introduced me to this guy here. Any of you know who that is? That is the younger version of Tony Robbins. That's when Tony was probably about 30 years old. And that's me with Tony. I used to work for Tony. Robert also introduced me to this guy, Marshall Thurber, who created something called Money and You. So I started systems thinking. And then I got introduced to Charles Muir, who taught me about Tantra and sacred sexuality. 
because in relationships, one of the ways we communicate is through intimacy and sex and sexuality. But most of us are not trained in that area. So I went and got trained. Then the biggest change, I think, these everybody on this board helped me create huge breakthroughs in my life. This guy is Marshall Rosenberg, and he transformed my life by teaching me about nonviolent communication. And my book, Argue Less, Love More, which I'm going to talk about tonight, because a lot of what I'm going to teach you tonight came from that book. The information I got, I got a lot of that from studying with Marshall. His book on nonviolent communications, What to Do, my book on Argue Less, Love More, it's the five things not to do, how to avoid these triggers. The next guy up on the list here, and this is not exactly sequential, is a guy named Bob Proctor. He was um, became a good friend of mine. And he was on The Secret, that movie, The Secret. And then there's Byron Katie, who taught me a lot about how to change beliefs that got in the way. And so what ended up happening is I took what I learned from all of them, created a best-selling book that was number one in five categories. I um, created a video that's been seen 6.7 million times, which boggles my mind that that's a possibility that I could do that. Did anybody, you know, 6 million people would want to know. And the last thing is I became a couples and intimacy coach. And they say you teach what you need to learn. And what I needed to learn was all about intimacy and communication. Because at one point when I, I actually ended up being partners with Marshall and I traveled around the world and when I went into companies and we went into like, I was a top paid consultant for the city of Albuquerque and most of their top management went through my course. I worked with a construction company in Hawaii, the Sheraton Hotels in Hong Kong, the Alaska Native Association. Companies paid $10,000 a month, I'm, I'm not a month, $10,000 a week to have me and my ex come in and solve problems in their company. And I quit all that to become a couples coach. Because this right here, if I didn't figure this out, I was gonna keep going through divorce and broken engagement. So there you go. That's how I got here, not a straight line. And I'd love to see what messages that people have here. All right, so let's dive in. Oh, this is a that's that picture of Tony and, and me a little closer, but Tony says it's the quality of your relationship based on the quality of your communication. And when your communication falls apart, so does your relationship. What Bob Proctor taught me is that when you're talking to people, it's good to give them a map so they know where they are and where they're going. So this is a, a, like a mini relationship map. And I'd like you to look at it and go, where are you now? There's five places. This is just a generalized guide. Are you in crisis? If you're in crisis, it's should I stay or should I go? And there's a place below for crisis and you're done. Like it's over. Conflict and every relationship has conflict. But if you're in a state of conflict, it's happening almost all the time. Stuck in a rut, that's like Groundhog Day where you end up recycling the same issues and the same stuff over and over again. It's not bad. It's not good. You're just sort of getting by. Are you in a good relationship where it's satisfying, but you know you're settling? Or are you in a great relationship? So if you're really adventurous, you can type in where you are, but you, you don't have to because we're all going to see that. But Okay, Sherman, any questions, anything you want to say so far? No, we're doing good so far. Liking it, keeping it going. No questions in the chat yet. And if you do get questions, put them in the chat. Now, teaching communication for over 25 years, I've learned two very sexy terms for it. There's ineffective communication. 
That's when your communication pushes love away and it creates resistance, resentment, regret. And then on the other side, the super sexy term is effective communication. And that brings love closer so that you create connection, compassion, and cooperation. So how many of you would like to have more effective communication? I can see you out there. How many of you want less effective communication? <laughs> okay. So here we go. We're diving in. And I this came to me this morning. The banana, the knife, and the hammer. This banana, bananas were hurt in the making of this photo. So I went to peel it this morning and it was a little green. So I needed to open the peel, not just by pulling it back. And I thought about it. I cut the, the banana, but I also could have used a hammer. So both of them would have been effective at opening the banana peel, but one of them would have destroyed the banana and one opened it and the banana was in good shape. Why I'm talking about a banana in communication is there's five ways we communicate that are a bit like the hammer. And so what we wanna learn is how to avoid communicating with the hammer and how to communicate. <laughs> Maybe the metaphor is not perfect. We don't wanna communicate with a knife either, but we want a more effective tool. Okay, here we go. So this is our participation part. In, and I'd love to hear how many of here speak are bilingual, at least two languages. Mediocre, you know, somewhere. How many here are trilingual? So if you could type in if you're bilingual, trilingual, whatever you are. And we do have a question in the chat that All right. lead right into this too, Paul. Okay. You want to read it, Samis? Yeah, it's from, um, I think I'm going to pronounce this right, Atria. Atiri? Atiri. Uh, maybe I'm saying it wrong either. Atira. 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 Okay. I'm called bossy and irritate people with my di directness. Also at 79, I am less patient with people. I am a good listener. How do I moderate me? Well, this whole conversation is going to be a, about the answer to that. Nice. So rather than trying to answer just quickly, what I want to do is, Atira, it, as we go through this, look at how to apply this. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to be powerful and direct, there's going to be a place where you're never going to make everybody happy. Right. And so part of it is how do you communicate with yourself about people who don't want to communicate with you or don't like the way you communicate? I am I am truly one of the best communicators I know, and I piss people off. And I can sound bossy and irritating, and I'm as compassionate as I know, and still there are going to be challenges. And then it's how do I communicate with them when they're upset with me? So I'm going to tell you, all of you speak three languages. How many languages? Hold up. Three. Yes, I can see all of you. All right. <laughs> now, there's the language of the head. Now, this tends to be the masculine language. It is the language of, feel, of, of logic, reason, facts, figures. You know, there was that... that TV show years ago, Dragnet. Just the facts, ma'am. Give me the facts. <laughs> now, this is great. And men and women tend to get rewarded in the business world for being logical, for fixing problems, for solving stuff, for communicating from their head. And when you're in your head, knowledge is key and vulnerability is what? Weakness. So when you're in your head, you don't want vulnerability. So now we come down to our heart. 
Now, which one is the language of relationships? Is it your head, facts and figures, or is it your heart, feelings and needs? Heart. Heart. Now, when you're in your heart, it's all about love. In your head, it's all about logic. In your heart, it's all about love. Now, feelings are not logical. Hmm. And this tends to be a feminine trait. And, and I'm, when I say feminine, we have masculine side, feminine. I've got a, a strong masculine side. I was a commercial fisherman in Alaska for 18 years. I have a strong feminine side. I'm connected to my heart. When I'm connected to my heart, I'm talking about my feelings and needs. Forget the facts. How do you feel? And in this case, vulnerability is key. One of the women I was engaged to had a photographic memory. Arguing with her was the most painful thing I've ever had to do because it always went back to the what? The facts. She had the facts. It didn't matter how I felt. So what we're going to do is look at how do you stay in the heart? The third one is the hurt. This is our reptile brain, and it's all about loss. We're trying to protect ourselves and safety. Now, when you're in your reptile brain, it's binary. What binary is, either or. You're either my enemy or my ally. You're either dangerous or you're safe. The other thing when you're in your reptile brain is you can't tell the difference between danger and discomfort. And if you feel uncomfortable, you feel like you're being threatened. Why this is important is, again, when you're in your reptile brain, vulnerability is the enemy. I don't want to feel vulnerable. So I resist being open and honest and vulnerable when I'm in my reptile brain because I'm afraid anything I say can and will be used against me. Is this making sense? So can you see some of your relationships in the past? Like if you're talking feelings and needs and your partner is listening for facts and figures, there's a big disconnect. Or if they're down here in their hurt and they're up there, it's hard to connect. And so I'm going to teach you how to connect and what to do and how to get a reptile when somebody's triggered, how to get a reptile up into their heart again. Now, one of my clients, I taught this to them. He flies 777s like those jumbo jets. And I got to tell you a story about him. He used it with an upset um, client or passenger. So I might as well tell it while I've got it started here. <laughs> they're landing. They're taxing up to the gate. And he's, he's yelling in the, in the back in the first class because that's right behind the, the pilot house there. And he says it's bulletproof door. And he could hear yelling through the door. Now, if there's... If you only get one thing from this class tonight, and that's not my intention, but you get one thing, write it down. Somebody write it in, in the, the memos here or in the chat box. Here is what he did to get the reptile brain back into her heart. He walked, so he's in there. They, I don't know what you call it, the dock the, the jumbo jet. The flight attendant comes and says, you got to come deal with this woman. She's freaking out. And he's walking back there going, what would Paul do? What would Paul do? What would Paul do? <laughs> he gets back there and everybody is looking at him because there's a woman freaking out. And he comes back and he puts his hand on her and he goes, excuse me, ma'am. What do you need to feel safe right now? So write those words down. What do you need? to feel safe right now. Now, you don't have to use the exact words, but the essence of that communicates everything that reptile needs to know. When I ask you, what do you need to feel safe right now? I'm telling you, I'm your ally. I'm your friend. I'm telling you how you feel matters to me. You're gonna be safe with me. And what happens, if that pulls them up into their heart or their head. And I've taught in prison. I taught eight and a half years. 
I taught minimum to maximum security inmates. All the tools I'm talking about tonight have been tested literally around the world. I have clients that I teach all around the world. Is this making sense? And so what you might want to look at is what's your safe language? Like, where do you go when you feel threatened? Do you go to your reptile? Or do you go to your head? I do both. I'm pretty good at going to my head because I'm pretty heady. That's my safe place. And I also can go to my reptile because growing up, that's what I was taught. That's what happened in my house. It was okay to be angry and upset, but it wasn't okay to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. What my dad taught me is he used to say things like, the best defense is a strong what? Offense. And he was very offensive. Mm. And the problem is when he's offensive with my mom, it did, and he was never physically violent, but he was worse at some levels. He was emotionally violent. And it looked like it wasn't safe in my family mm-hmm. to be in your heart. The feelings that were okay were to be angry. Is this all making sense? Yes. Yep. Now, we are recording this because you may want to watch this a couple of times. I'm trying to compress 25, 30 years into a little bit over an hour. <laughs> now, I guarantee you, you haven't seen this chart before. Actually, I was talking to Sherman and we kind of talked this one out together. And he's been helpful in, in making it clearer. So at the bottom is reactive communication. And when we're in reaction, I either can dominate or be dominated. It's win, lose, or in a relationship, it's lose, lose. Because how many of you like it when your partner dominates you and makes you do what you, how many of you like that? See, I'm not seeing any hands go up. (laughs) And what happens when you dominate? Does your partner love you? Not likely. So when we're in reaction, it's dominate or be dominated. When we're responsive, which is the next level up, someone can, it's so if Sherman, I'll play with you a little bit, but if say Sherman and I want to go to a restaurant and we're in reaction, I'm arguing, go to McDonald's. He's arguing Burger King. Now we haven't talked about this. I, he may never eat it either of them. Burger King for sure. Okay. <laughs> so we would have an argument about it and it's one or the other. The next level up is responsive. I could say, I could go to him and say, we have to eat at Burger King. And he could go, yes, no, what about this? So he could, he has, when you're, when you're responsive, you have choice. Mm -hmm. When you're reactive, no choice. When you're resourceful, and a friend of mine, Scott Katamas, who's also a another love coach talks about being resourceful all the time you've got something you can bring to the conversation when you're resourceful you don't feel attacked like you can go hey what about thai food or chinese food you're you can bring up other foods you ha- when you're resourceful you have what i call options down here no options so When I'm reactive, trust is low. When I'm resourceful, trust is pretty high. And then the top one here is revealing. So if if I think that Sherman is the enemy and I'm in my reptile brain in fear, I'm not going to reveal my feelings. I'm not going to talk about my vulnerabilities. I'm going to try to protect myself. The only time I'm going to reveal my feelings and vulnerabilities is when I think he's the ally and there's a high level of trust. Is this making sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. And part of what I'm going to do tonight, this is all like a big setup because if if you communicate 
and make these five mistakes I'm about to teach you, it almost guarantees somebody's going to go and be reactive. And it's going to drive you out of here. If you want a great relationship, you've got to be able to reveal what's alive in you, your vulnerability, your fears, your doubts, your dreams, your desires, all of those things. And what I want as we're going along in the chat box, if you have a big aha, like you go, oh my, like type it in there, let me know. And let me just tell you, if I can learn this, almost anybody can, because I was really reactive. I learned a lot from my dad, a lot that I had to unlearn. And my first and only divorce came, and I was together with her for 18 years. Hmm. And most of those years, I was a reactive communicator. If you hurt my feelings, I would let you know how much I hurt you hurt my feelings by withholding love, affection, attention, I was somewhat obnoxious. I'm embarrassed to say how obnoxious I was, but I wanna give you an idea that there's hope for almost anybody here. I remember at one point, I used to smoke cigarettes many years ago and I, Corrine ended up being sick and I was smoking in bed, not only like smoking in the house, but smoking in bed. And she asked me if I would smoke in the other room. Now, when you're reactive and somebody asks you something, if you feel like somebody's trying to control you and nobody's going to control and dominate me. So what I say, if you don't like to smoke, you can go in the other room. Now, I kind of choke on my own words when I say that because it's so obnoxious. And we're still friends, Corrine and I, and we haven't been married for over 20 years, but we've stayed friends through this, and I don't know how. <laughs> but what we want to do is, if you want to get up to create a safe place so you can reveal, you've got to be allies, there's got to be a high level of trust. And when you're talking, you're sharing with versus talking at. And I have to watch myself. How many of you ever find yourself talking at somebody like you really don't worry about what they think or what that you just keep going for it you're gonna like convince them of something and when you're listening there's two ways when you're down in the reactive you're listening for two things one you're listening for a moment of silence so you can dive in <laughs> and let them know what's going on in you the other thing, you're listening for things that you can use against them in your basically building up your argument. Mm. <laughs> and if any of you relating to either side of that, oh, by the yeah. way, that's called, and this is going to be part of the five, case building. You're building a case. You're gathering evidence to build a case to prove that you're right, they're wrong. And it can be good intention. You could be building a case like why they shouldn't do drugs or why they shouldn't have unprotected sex, or they shouldn't do all, all, I mean, there's a whole world of things that you can try to build a case again, and all you're gonna do is get resistance because they're gonna, they're not gonna feel heard. So it's learning how to listen to somebody, not listening for info. Is this making sense? Any ahas going on there? Paul, we got two comments. Um, Sonia is saying awesome reminders. Thanks. And um, Atira is saying she's got a long -term time friend that always responds, I don't know, over and over. Um, to me, that is being, she's saying to me, it's being evasive and not taking responsibility. How would you help her apply this? Well, I would see if we're being evasive, part of it, especially if it's a woman, it's, I would want to know, was it safe for her to have an opinion growing up? Mm. Because there's a lot of time where it's not safe. And so mm. the safest thing for men, what men do, men go silent. They do the submarine. 
Like mm -hmm. they'll see their partner talking and they go quiet. And it's like, I hope because they're afraid anything I say, what can <laughs> and will be used against me. So it's yeah. better to be quiet. Yeah. That's so, what he's doing. Yeah, exactly. What I, what I would do is try to create safety mm -hmm. and go, can you tell me what came up for you when you heard that? Are you feeling nervous? Are you feeling afraid? You know, so it's like trying to enter their world and knowing that if you really enter their world and they feel heard, understood, and valued, they want to tell you what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so often in either their childhood or maybe in their marriage, it wasn't safe to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. So here we're going to dive into the five triggers. And the more triggered we get, the higher our emotions, the lower our intelligence. And there's something I call the listening switch. And when you get triggered, what happens to the listening switch? Turns off. <laughs> and see, if the listening switch is off, it doesn't matter how much you talk to them, what you say to them, it's it's gone. They are out of here. It's like Charlie Brown. And all he hears from his teacher is wah, 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 wah. <laughs> And the problem is we do the exact opposite of what we should do. Right. When the listening switch goes off, we try to tell them from six different ways. Well, if I tell them this way or this way or this way, and the f more we talk, the further away they get. And what we have to do is really enter their world to find out the number one thing. Do they feel safe to talk? Mm-hmm. They don't feel safe to talk. And if what you say is used against them, they're not going to want to talk to you. So here's what we're going to dive into. How to identify, how to avoid. So there's five mistakes. So how to identify them, how to avoid them, how to recognize when you're making them, because we're all going to make them, even though I make them. I wrote the book on it, and I make them. <laughs> how to repair when you make them and how to create a safe space. So number one, mistake, case building. And at the end of this, I'm gonna tell you, if you want a deeper dive into creating heart-to-heart -heart communication, I'm gonna tell you how you can work with me and at least get the book for free. So would that be a good thing to be able to get my best-selling book? For basically, you pay shipping and handling, so it's six ninety seven or something. But it's it's basically for free. You don't pay the twenty some dollars that Amazon's got. So case building. In case building, anything you say, what can and will be used against you in the bedroom, in the bathroom, in front of friends and family, to make you feel bad, stupid, and wrong. Wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you an example of what happens in case building. And so I'm going to ask everybody to put their hands together like this so I can see them. And no, we're not praying. Not that praying is not a good idea because we can use all the help we can get. When I say go, what I want you to do is press really hard with your right hand. Now, if you know what I'm doing, don't do it. But ready, get set, press. Now press harder, press harder, harder, harder. Okay, stop. All right, so Atira, can I talk to you for a second? Can you unmute? Yep, okay. All right, so where are your hands? Pretty much where they started, right? Yeah. So what did I say? Press, press really hard? Huh? Uh, my left hand immediately wanted to resist. Why? No good reason. <laughs> well, as soon as you use force, what happens? You get counterforce. It's yes. called war. And see, the thing is, anytime that we communicate in a way, and we're so taught to use force in our communication. Just tell them how bad, stupid, and wrong they are, how right, smart, and powerful we are. And it, the more that we push on them, the more that they resist. And it's mm -hmm. almost like we could be saying, Atira, bend over and pick up that $100 bill. And you're like, go to hell. 
Nobody can tell me to pick up a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So as soon as we're getting resistance, why we're getting resistance is we get a perceived idea that someone's building a case against us. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas of case building. Just think about you guys, you're in a partnership and you haven't been intimate in a week or two. Go to your partner and convince them, build a case about why they should have sex. <laughs> See how well that one works. What are you going to get? Resistance, resentment, regret. Mm -hmm. And here's another one I'll give you that's out of real life story. When I was on the Mad Dogs exhibition ski team, we were 18, 19, I think up until 20. Now the moms in Stowe, Vermont, told all their daughters what? To avoid the Mad Dogs exhibition ski team. What do you think the daughters all wanted to do? <laughs> it was the best marketing we ever could have had. The moms <laughs> in Stowe, Vermont, telling their daughters to leave them alone. That the moms had a, gave us a much worse reputation than we actually deserved. But they wanted to find out who we were and hang out with us. <laughs> now, how many of you have ever built a case against yourself? Like that you're clumsy, stupid, lazy, you should go on a diet, you should quit smoking, you should stop drinking. How well did that work? It was, it's really challenging. And any time that you're using shame, blame, guilt to try to convince somebody of something, you are what? Case building. That mm -hmm. is mistake number one. And those are some of the ways you can do it. So you're pushing people away and building a case when you're listening to gather evidence and prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. You're building connection when somebody says something to you and you go, tell me more. You really want to enter their world. And this is another like writer downer so that they feel these three things. They feel heard, understood, and valued. How many of you would love to have somebody in your life that says, tell me more on a regular basis? Most people are going like, okay, I got it. Could you please stop? So mm -hmm. there's a lot more of this on page 30 and 32. I want to be able to get through all of the five of them. The next one is storytelling. Once upon a time. Now, by the way, how many of you build cases on a regular basis? Yeah. <laughs> if you're not raising your hand, I would say... <laughs> Okay, I'm building a case that you build cases. I still do it. <laughs> so the mind is a meaning-making machine. And anytime something happens, we make up a meaning around it. The thing mm -hmm. is, I'm calling that meaning a story. Mm -hmm. And what happens is we end up believing our stories. And oftentimes, our stories don't put our partner in a good light. And what we want to do is be able to bust our stories. So some stories create pain, some not so much. If we change our story, we can change our feelings. And I'm going to give you a code for that. Now, you only can do this with a person like when you're not in the middle of an upset. Because if you ask them, honey, what story are you telling yourself? And they don't know this as a respectful code they're going to think that you might be talking down to them. Mm -hmm. I don't, when somebody says this to me, I don't think they're talking down to me. I think they want to understand me. So I'm going to give you an example of this. Kristen and I, we used to live together. And at night, on my side of the bed, there's a switch for the overhead light. On her side of the bed, there was a, a little reading light. So I tended to fall asleep first. So I would turn off the overhead light and leave her with the reading light. One night I look over and she's pissed off. I can tell that because 25 years of training, 
I know when somebody pissed off. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, honey, what story are you telling yourself? <laughs> now, what story do you think she was telling herself about the lights? The story she was telling herself is Paul gets the good light. And then when Paul's done reading, he turns off the good light. And I got to re read by this little crappy light. <laughs> And she tells me that. And I listen. And I'm like, tell me more. I got it. She felt heard, understood, and valued. And when she did, and this is another code, that emptied her cup. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And I said, can you hear my story? Do you think my story was possibly different than her story? Mm -hmm. My story is, when I go to sleep, if I don't turn out the light, then she has to get out of bed, walk around the bed, turn out the light, and then walk back in the dark, stub her toe, and I think I'm taking care of her mm -hmm. by turning out the light. Now, she heard my story. So fast forward one night. It's the next night. I go, and I'm about to turn out the light, and I remember her story. I go, honey, if you want, I'll leave the light out. I'll just go to sleep and you can get up and go and turn it off. She goes, no, now that I know your story, what? Turn out the light. I'd rather read by this and be able to fall asleep. So what changed? The only thing that changed was the story. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you about the sponge in the sink story, coming home late, no sex for two weeks. Another story Tintel on the tree wrong. I flew back to Vermont. At this point, I was the highest paid consultant for the city of Albuquerque. I am the top management's going through my course. My dad has put has me put tinsel on the Christmas tree and gives me a, about a 45 minute lecture on how I put tinsel on the tree wrong. <laughs> but he had a story about what? What was right and what was wrong. And I was <laughs> Literally, I almost wrote off my dad. I said, I do not need to fly back from, at that point, um, New Mexico to, to Vermont to get lectured on not doing the tree right. <laughs> Another one that creates a lot of stories is when your partner gives you the oh, look. The look. <laughs> so, Samis, are you relating, you know, or Sherman, who's relating to any of this? <laughs> oh, this is definitely definitely resonating. So, and it's what we're trying to learn is how to create new patterns. So you know you're stuck in your story and you're pushing your partner away when you're unwilling to hear your partner's side. And you think that there is a right and a wrong, and you're right and they're what? Wrong. Mm -hmm. You also know you're stuck in your story if you're embarrassed or afraid to tell your partner what's really going on in your head. Mm -hmm. The opposite of that is you're busting your story if your partner is upset and you say, I wonder what story you're telling yourself. Tell mm -hmm. me more. Mm -hmm. And you tell your story and then ask, is it true? You, you check your story out. You try to listen and understand your partner's story. And you don't think that there is a fact, like there's a right story and a wrong story. There's only my story and their story. And if you want to create connection and heart-to-heart -heart connection, understand their story. Mm -hmm. Now, as we're going through, take notes. Which of these mistakes makes the biggest problems for you or triggers you the most is a case building storytelling and this one message assuming and the normal outcome as i already said the normal outcome of most communication misunderstanding so when it comes to message assuming misunderstanding happens all the time so i'll tell you a story i was meeting my clients in town we were going to meet in person at three o'clock so we had juggled back and forth on text. And here's the thing. A lot of times, so Sherman talk, 
sends me a message and I say, oh, I got it in my head. If I don't send him back a message, he doesn't know whether I got it or not. So a lot of times messages are sent, but you don't know if the listener received it unless they demonstrate understanding. So I'm going to show how this applies. My clients send me a message. Meet at three. In my brain, I go, okay, I got it. And then I show up at three and no client. Because I never what? Demonstrated understanding and completed it. How do you demonstrate an un understanding and complete it? Sorry. You let the person know what you heard them say. Mm -hmm. And if if Sherman came to me and said, I understand you, or actually I'll change that. If Sherman came to me and said, do you understand? I wouldn't say yes. I would say, here's what I think I understand. Did I get it right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what you do. <laughs> because even if I say I understand, I might not understand at all. Right. So I'll give you another example of this. Pizza. Anybody ever order pizza over the phone? Any of you? <laughs> you know the secret to communicating. What's the last thing the pizza person says? Let me repeat your order to you. Exactly. So, Samis, you ordered the 12 inch pepperoni. You live at this block. Your credit card is this. Your phone number is this. Why do they repeat it, Samis? Make sure that they got a good understanding and they won't be sending you your neighbor's pizza. <laughs> Yes, another way of saying that, because they know that the normal outcome of most communications, what? Misunderstanding. See, and if you know it's, that's the normal outcome, you don't take it personally. So in message assuming, when you're speaking, what I would do is ask, say, Sherman, can you tell me what you heard me say? And I'm doing this all along as I'm teaching here. Can you mm -hmm. tell me what you heard me say? And when you I'm listening... Now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm listening to Sherman, I might go, can I tell you what I think I heard? And here's a key to this. 40 words max. Mm -hmm. So don't go more than 40 words before you check in with the other person. Because when you go to word 41, Word one kicks off. That's as big as my little memory drive is. Okay, and Paul. if you that's look, usually, at, I got a point okay. here. That's usually hard to do to know when you hit forty. What's what would you say is like two or three sentences? How about what would be a good range in order to use to communicate that concept? Here's a. Here, thank you for asking that, Sherman. The more in, important it is, and the more emotional it is the shorter it needs to be. 40 is the maximum. If it's really important, it's a single sentence. Mm -hmm. Honey, I love you and I'm really scared right now. Can you tell me what you heard me say? Yeah, you're going to flake. <laughs> okay, thank you. So notice I say thank you and then I say, can I try again? Because I don't, I'm going to try to be responsible for what they heard, not just what I said. That's a critical thing. So you don't try to correct what they heard? No. I say, let me try a different way. Okay. Because otherwise, see, they told you what they heard. Okay. So when you're message assuming, you interrupt somebody because you think you already know what they're going to say. Mm hmm you end up at a different restaurant or a different location. You stop listening to your partner before they're done talking and you're preparing what you're going to say. If your message clarifying, your lover's talking and you go, let me tell you what I think I heard you say. And you might interrupt your partner. There's two different ways of interrupting. Interrupt because I think I already know or interrupt because I want to clarify. 
So Sherman, let me slow you down for a second. I really want to be able to follow you because he's a tech guy and he could drown me in his techno babble or techno wizardry. <laughs> so I've got to ask him to go slow. Or I can ask him, can you tell me what you heard me say? Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand you. Could you tell me in a different way? I want to ask you, how different would your relationships have been or will be if you really apply, if you master what I'm teaching here today? A little or a lot? A lot. It's huge. So we've got two more to go. I'm going to keep cranking. And any again, any insights like, oh, my God, I tell you, my forehead would get flattened. I keep going, oh, I... I can't believe I did that and I did that. <laughs> so number four is cup stuffing. And I, I didn't bring a, a, a cup in here. Oh, there we go. Good. Now, Samis, I'm going to ask you, if this cup is full, how much more can I put in it? Nothing more. What if I yell at it? Nothing more. What if I withhold love and affection and attention? Still nothing more. So if I want to put something in this cup, what do I have to do? Empty. Empty some, some of it out or empty all of it out. And here's, you know, the intimacy, into me see. There's a way of spelling that. In to <laughs> me see. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have heard that. Empathy. I spell it a different way. Empty me first. Mm -hmm. So if I want somebody to hear me and their cup is full, and what I mean by cup is full, it's like when I taught in prison, because I taught in prison for eight and a half years, I would come home and my cup was full. It, it's a long drive. It was an emotional day. Going into prison, even if you know you're going to get let out, there's something about those doors closing, going clang. It's a shock on the nervous system. So when I get home, it would not be a good time for my partner to go, Paul, we need to talk about your spending habits. It would not be setting either of us up to win. Right. So what needs to happen is when your partner comes to you, and they are in pain or upset. Well, let me back up a tiny bit. When the feminine comes to the masculine, and this has nothing to do whether you're man or a woman. I work with straight couples, gay couples, lesbian couples. So there's if, if someone's in their masculine energy and someone in their feminine energy comes up to them in pain, the masculine thinks it's either my fault or my responsibility. So I'm going to try to fix you as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, how many of you feminines like to be fixed? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there's one. Okay, good. Yeah, come fix me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a rare thing for that to happen. What do most feminines want? And and I, there, part of me, it's got very strong feminine side. What do I want? I want to be understood. I'm going to draw this triangle a lot. Heard, understood, understood and valued. And valued. So here's another magic sentence to write down. When your partner comes to you in pain, ask them this. Honey, do you want empathy? or ideas. Now, and I'm the idea guy. This drives me berserk because I want, you know, if somebody comes to me in pain, I'm thinking 50 different ways you could be out of pain in 10 minutes and they can't hear me because their cup is full. So what do I have to do first? Give them what? Empathy. Empathy. This is this could be a relationship saver by itself. Do you need empathy or ideas? Mm -hmm. You know your cup stuffing. If your partner's already stressed out, 
and you're trying to have an important conversation with them without checking in first. So what you can do is go, honey, how's your cup? I want to talk about finances. I want to talk about our vacation. I want to talk about our kids. I want to talk about business. If you know your cup emptying, if your partner comes home stressed out and you greet him or her with a question, do you need empathy for your hard day or you need space to decompress? So it's either empathy or ideas, empathy or space. So there's more here. Go to page 71 and page 77. And if you think I'm wanting you to get the book, I absolutely am. This book <laughs> is an act of love. It took six years to write this itty bitty thing. And it's, you're not going to get everything I can give you tonight by just this quick conversation. Now, the last one is called the fatal F's. <laughs> And what the fatal Fs are, fix, fight, flee. So my handwriting sucks. Now, when I already said this, this ties in when the, the masculine's default setting, when the feminine comes in pain, it's either my fault or my responsibility and I need to fix you fast. So Atira, can I talk to you again? So um, if I come to you and you're in pain and I'm trying to fix you fast, how does that feel? It would be too much. Just, I would say, just go away. <laughs> just go away. And what happens to intimacy? Ah, uh, forget it. <laughs> Now, here's one of the master skills. Now, I talk about seven skills, not tonight, but in, in on my other courses. One of the master skills is the ability to, what is it? What's the term there? Be with. Be with. If I can't be with your pain, I'm going to try to fix you. If I can't be with your upset, I'm going to try to fix you. Now, mothers do this with their kids. Husbands do it with their wives. Wives do this with their husband. If I can't be with you, I'm going to try to fix you. And the longer you're in pain, the more uncomfortable I feel because I'm telling myself a what? A story that it's my fault that mm -hmm. you're hurting. Mm -hmm. And the more you hurt, the worse I feel about myself. So what do we have? We have two people with their cups full. Yeah. And if you look at it, here's a different way to look at communication. All is, and I'll say not all, but all emotional communication, either an act of love or a cry for help. Now, one way of looking at it, cry for help feels like if I'm, in my fix-it mode, it feels like an attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I'm attacking, if I'm feeling I'm getting attacked, I want to defend myself. Mm -hmm. And act of love, I can make it do, somebody's trying to do it to me. They're, here's somebody trying to give me a gift, and I perceive it as somebody's trying to do it to me. So what we want to be able to do is translate into either an act of love or cry for help. And what do all people want? They want to be heard, heard, understood, understood and valued. Yeah. And I have done podcasts and work with clients in India, Africa, England, Australia, Mexico, Belize, Bali, Croatia. And it pretty much universal. The human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed exactly as it is. Mm. So mm. our tendency and part of what I want to I do is identify the patterns so you can interrupt the patterns. So Sonia, I'm having envy here i see you bouncing and i'm like god i should have a bouncy ball that looks cool to me <laughs> the little kid in me goes that that looks like fun 
cool. So when our partner comes home, like Kristen used to work with at-risk youth in Denver, and she would get, she get, she had her ideas of how to connect with the at-risk youth, and the administration was telling her she needs to be more strict and more disciplined, which to her totally didn't work because she understood this rule right here. The more force she uses with an at-risk kid, the more what? Resistance she's going to get. And then right. admins trying to get her to use more force. So what happens is they try to fix you. And when that doesn't work, what do they do? Fight mm -hmm. with you and then flee from you. So that is it. Those are the five ones. If you're fixing, you're trying to jump in and offer <laughs> advice. If you're fighting, you start an argument, like what's wrong with them. You're angry that your partner doesn't do it your way. If you're fleeing, you get uncomfortable and can't be with them. If you're listening empathetically, you start with, do you want empathy or ideas or space? You can ask them all three of those. Mm -hmm. Your first reaction is listening instead of offering a solution. And this is one of the hardest ones for me because I am like right there, ask Sherman. I, I, I'm the <laughs> idea guy. Mm -hmm. he, he can't even finish the question. I've got 10 ideas I want to tell him. Mm -hmm. So I'm overcoming my own patterns and tendencies. So instead of running away from your partner, you might say, I have strong feelings about this. Could you listen and give me some empathy? So you're trying to dance with these. Mm -hmm. so what I'd love to do is hear from each of you, which one of these causes the most problem for you, triggers you the most? Is it when partner is case building, storytelling, message assuming, cup stuffing, or the fatal Fs? Which one do you, and I put this, liberally which one do you hate the most so you put in hate dash and put in oh i see some number four in there and stuff now here is do you, here's how you're going to get the most out of tonight after you write in which one you hate the most write in which one you do the most because that's where you're going to have the most power like for me Probably the fatal Fs. I'm I'm good at that. And sometimes I'm good at storytelling versus story busting. So those are my weak spots. What's your weak spot? Put that in the chat box. Get bold here. And make a declaration that you want to have a breakthrough in that area. Now. Would it be okay if Hold I... Hold on, Paul. Too quick. Back up a little. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. No, no one's responded in the chat yet. So maybe give them a minute to, to put which one. Sherman's going to hold us to it. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> Me hate message assuming. Do storytelling and case building. Yeah. See, the way to have a breakthrough around this is to be able to laugh about it and go, oh, yeah, I'm doing that case building thing, aren't I? And you can laugh with your partner. Don't take yourself serious. You'll have a breakthrough. <laughs> case building, message assuming, do the most, fixing the fatal F, fix, fight, flee. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Sherman, for they're slowing me down. All right. Here we go. Would it be okay if I took a few minutes to talk about how I help couples and individuals go from conflict to compassionate connection and communicate from heart to heart? Would it be okay if I talk a little bit about the work I do? All right. This is yes. That's from some people. You got to get I, all right, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> now, here is a baby step. If you go to argue less, love more, dot net forward slash free book, you will see the amazing work of the awesome Sherman here. 
and it will take you through and you spend, you put up your, it's $6.97 to cover the cost of shipping and everything and handling, but you get the book. Now, this book, this couple right here is a couple I worked with and they work together and she runs a women's clothing line. She's amazing. This was a weekend wedding in Arizona oh. and it was at a hot springs and we camped and it was like, it was like a mini burning man wedding. Mm -hmm. And the only gift that they gave all of the people who showed up was, what do you think? A book. A copy of the book because they believed in it because the re she says they're married today because of the work that we did together and they had a huge breakthrough and were able to communicate heart to heart. Nice. What is it that I do? I help people with communication problems falling back in love. Remember why they fell in love. If there's no intimacy, normally there's an issue that hasn't been communicated and it's destroying intimacy. Help people feel like partners again and get them ready to be in a relationship. I don't deal in a couple with addiction. Um, I have individual clients that I talk to because partly it's what they're not able to be with in themselves. And mm -hmm. domestic abuse, nope. But cheating and sometimes polyamorous relationships. If there's lack of emotional support, I have had couples that came to me because they thought they were over and they ended up getting married mm. and other ones that came to me and ended up getting a breakup. Mm. Uh, my job is not to keep couples together. My job is to help couples be authentic and find out what's really true for them. Right. Oftentimes financial issues because of how decisions are made. And then especially this is for a lot of women that are now in their 40s, late 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they were told, be a good wife, be a good woman, take care of the kids, take care of the husband, take care of everything else. And then someday it will be your turn. And they're kind of mm -hmm. like, excuse me? But yeah. what the hell? It's not been my turn yet. And mm -hmm. it's like, can I be myself and still be in a relationship with you or be in a relationship with anyone? And they're finding themselves because that's the most important relationship to have and how you communicate with yourself. So one thing you can do if you want to go beyond baby steps is to schedule a heart to heart conversation where we look at and it's it's on Zoom. It's about 30 minutes long. And we look at what's blocking your con your heart to heart conversation and vulnerability, some solutions. And you can decide on what actions to take and you'll leave the conversation feeling clear, courageous, and with a plan. And here's what some people said after many attempts at couples work with other individuals working with Paul has Thank finally you. helped my partner and I break through to a new place of understanding and appreciation for each other. What did they learn? They learned about how to communicate. How? Heart to what? Heart. The next one, we came as a last ditch effort to save our relationship. We figured if a psychologist couldn't help, then how could a relationship coach be a benefit? All I can say is I'm glad we took the chance with Paul. It's made a huge difference. How did what I teach him? How to communicate how? Heart to heart. How to avoid these five mistakes I'm talking about and how to implement these other ones that I haven't really gone into. That's going to be a different call. And the last one, Linda, she had been married 25 years and things were so out of whack when she came to me. During their anniversary, she was going to a silent retreat and had for several years because she didn't even want to be around her husband for the mm -hmm. anniversary. There was mm -hmm. betrayal, cheating, lying, money issues, you name it. She started out feeling hopeless and alienated in their marriage and wondered if it was over. And working with Paul was a last ditch effort. I came away feeling empowered, hopeful and willing. The future is wide open. And her husband didn't come and do the work. Now, it's better, easier, more fun when both people do it. Mm -hmm. Now, when should you get a breakthrough session? 
Now, in California, this is not the exact picture, but this really inspired it. I drove past a car. That's what their tire looked like. And at that point, it was what? Too late to fix the tire. No return. <laughs> yes, the point of no return. And there's relationships that come to me like that, too. The guy came to me. One guy came. He said, you know, I came home and my wife had, during the day, my wife had showed up with a moving company and basically cleaned out almost everything but the kitchen table. Can you help us? I said, you know, I think it's probably a little bit too late. I think he missed some what? Warning signs. Right. <laughs> probably years and years of warning signs. Yeah. So is it urgent? Well, this tire is low enough that you don't even want to drive on it. Right. You want to get it's it's in critical care and you need to take action right away. And if it's just a warning, it's important. Why not work on it now? And what's the answer, at least to me? Schedule a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. How do you do it? You go here. What's it cost? At this point, nothing. Why does it cost nothing? Because I want to see if you are somebody I want to work with, and you get a chance to see if I'm somebody you want to work with. Because I don't take everybody. And I only, I'm about to leave out to California. So I only have like about six sessions available. So if you're interested, you go to argueless.lovemore.net forward slash heart. And the first step here is it's going to take you to a calendar. You pick one of the days, click on it, pick a time, and then enter your name and email, answer about three or four questions so you can help me help you. Now, the, link is in, the link is in the chat if anyone wanted. To. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Yes. There's also another testimonial in there, Paul. Oh, cool. It's from Sonia. She said, what I loved about working with Paul was improving my relationship without my husband's participation for 20, 23, well, 23 years now. All right, we didn't work together for 23 years. She's been in the oh, relationship. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Sonia is one of my loyalist customers. Nice. <laughs> now, here's a, one of the reasons that a lot of relationship coaching, therapy, counseling doesn't work. Because if the couple doesn't agree on the problem, they won't agree on the solution. And a lot of times when people go into therapy or counseling or coaching, they're trying to figure out, who is problem? Yeah. And nobody wants to be the problem. What you have to do is find out what is the problem. Mm -hmm. And what is the problem is typically how we're communicating. Now, one other quick testimonial, and then we're going to wrap this whole thing up. A couple that I worked with, and they were... He, he wanted to work together, didn't want to work together. It took him like three months to finally decide it. And he was so disappointed with himself at the end that he waited those three months. But here's what she said she got. She got back her feminine power and went from feeling like he had all the power and the final say to understanding he wants to be her hero and make her happy. Do you think that that's a small transformation or a huge one? That's huge. 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 She used the heart-to-heart -heart communication method, entered his world, and was able to hear, understand, and value him. And how do you think he felt? This gave her more patience, confidence, and compassion, and connection with her lover. And she was able to figure out what her top 10 needs were beneath almost every upset that she had. She mm -hmm. stopped taking his masculinity personally and started to understand and even enjoy the differences between the sexes. Now, how many of you were excited by some of that once? Bring some of that home. Right. <laughs> Here's what he said. He stopped taking himself so seriously and started to have more fun. He started to understand the differences between the masculine and feminine or the men and women in a way that was empowering and enjoyable for both of them. He was able to enter her world so she felt heard, understood, and valued. He felt like her hero. And this is a critical one. 
He stopped worrying about what he said and became very interested in what she heard. He mm. stopped worrying about what he said and became very interested in what she heard. Mm -hmm. That was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. He loved the way they both became aware of the impact of using any BSW language, bad, stupid, wrong. So mm -hmm. again, what's, what's to do? Go to argueless, lovemore.net, schedule a time. Now, here is my badass statement for the end of the day. If it's important enough, you'll find a way. If it's not, you'll find an excuse. Mm -hmm. If saving your relationship or transforming your relationship or even transforming the relationship with yourself is important enough, you'll find a way. And if I'm not your teacher, because I'm sort of I'm sort of a a bit like a dude. I get along really well with dudes. I speak to a lot of my clients work at Silicon Valley and speak computer ease. I can do that. And I also get along well with the feminine. But if I'm not your person, go find somebody, get a mentor. I have multiple mentors to help me. One thing you'll notice, any expert anywhere in the world, they have mentors and coaches. <laughs>